right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mike Eilon, and I am the CEO of Greek University. Our town hall today is called Getting Jobs During COVID-19, and I have with us a jobs pro with tons of great information to share with our college students, our recent graduates, as well as professionals who are looking to get jobs or internships right now. Andrew is the founder and CEO at Andrew Hudson's Jobs List. Andrew Hudson's Jobs List has been Colorado's premier job board for 20 years. It started in 1998 with a few hundred followers, and today they have more than 35,000 subscribers who receive the weekly updates, and hundreds of thousands more visit Andrew Hudson's Jobs List each month. Currently, Andrew Hudson's Jobs List posts more than 1,000 jobs per month, and according to a recent survey that was done, 70% of employers who are posting jobs found Andrew Hudson's Jobs List to be the best website for finding new employees. So we are certainly very excited to have Andrew Hudson with us today. Welcome to the town hall, Andrew. Thank you so much, I'm happy to be here. Just as a precursor, if you uh, hear some noise in the background, I've got an eight and a 10 year old who are at home and uh, they tend to run around a little bit and make a little noise, but I'll try and, uh, try and keep them quiet. That's quite all right. We're all adjusting to this new normal. So I have a 15 year old and a 13 year old at home as well. So I also try to do my best to keep right, them quiet right. while I'm taping, but this is real life. This is what's really right. happening in homes all across America. So you're certainly uh, you know, not unique in that regard. <laughs> yep. Well, that's great. So first off, you know, I think it's wonderful that you joined us here today because you're a real person. People might yeah. not know that. People might think that you're an avatar or somebody that was created by a bunch of uh, business folks that thought it would be great to name their website, Andrew Hudson. But for the last 20 years, you have been helping job seekers find work and you've been helping employers connect with the best professionals around. And I know that you love what you do. So why are you so passionate about helping people with their job search and managing their careers? Well, it, it comes from a couple different places. I think number one, um, I do, I pinch myself every day to remind myself how blessed I am that I've actually found my career and found my calling. Um, you know, like many people, I, I've had different iterations of my career from the time I graduated from college to where I am now. But uh, I really, I started Andrew Hudson's jobs list as a hobby. And it was just kind of a pay it forward thing. I was the press secretary for the mayor of Denver. And I was trying to create a uh, way to kind of leapfrog the mainstream press. And so I created an email list that was uh, influencers. They were just connections in the community, in the business community, um, journalists, uh, government, political types. And it was a way to get out information about the mayor and what he was up to. And I was really trying to just create cocktail party chatter so that people would get direct news from our office. I mean, it wasn't revolutionary or anything. And then people started sending me jobs and they said, we understand you have this list of about 300 very influential people. Can you start sending out the jobs to them? And that's kind of how the whole thing started and created. And, you know, it's, um, I'm passionate about it because number one, I think that there's, people throughout their lives that need advice about their careers and people get stuck and people are curious and they, they get to mid-career crises sometimes where you know they've been laid off or they have a boss they don't like or they just want to do something else and so I decided to become an expert in you know how do you handle that and how do you deal with that and so uh, it's, it's incredibly rewarding and it's incredibly fun as well because I, I love seeing the transformation of people and watching them you know like me find a career that they're they're very happy with yeah you're really helping everybody in Colorado and now with this call and, and your words going all across the country you're helping people really all over America so uh, that's a, an amazing legacy that you're leaving uh, and certainly one that uh, we should all be striving for I think you're really making a difference um, thank you now, 
Yeah. So uh, today you have hundreds of thousands of visitors that visit your website every month. And uh, your recent survey showed that 70% of employers posted jobs. They thought your website was the best for finding new employees. So why do you think your website in particular works so well? Well, when we go back to the history of job boards, you know, I remember the first time that somebody came to me and they said, have you heard of monster.com? You know, and I had been, I've been actually thinking about this idea about, you know, how do you connect employees with uh, employers? And I went to monster.com and it was this incredible website. You know, you type in an address, you type in salary, you type in job title and all of that and zip all of these jobs would come up. But I think what his, we've all found out over time is that Monster has literally become a monster and job boards like them, these big national job boards become very difficult to navigate. They become difficult for the employers who are now having hundreds of employers or hundreds of job seekers that are applying for that one job. And then for the job seekers perspective, you're all of a sudden competing against hundreds of people that are not really local. They're from all over the world. And so what happens with my website, and I think this is true, if you, you see a lot of this with the internet, is people want to know what's going on five miles from their house. People want to go what's going on in their community. And for the job seekers, you know, now they're, they've got a better shot because they're competing with people locally. And for the employers, you know, they're able to tap into the best talent that is local. It's not to say that people from around the world don't come to my website or from around the country, but for the most part, they're able to tap into this uh, this local talent that is that is here right in Colorado. Yeah, I think that's so important. I also, when you tell that story, I start thinking about local newspapers, for example, and they're having a lot of time trying to uh, stay in business and they've cut payroll in terms of all their editors and uh, their reporters. And it's very difficult to get the local message out, which is still so critical today and if we let all these local newspapers go out of business, then where are we in terms of reporting all the local news, right? Well, and, and I will tell you, you know, we used to have two competing, thriving newspapers here in Colorado, the Rocky Mountain News and the Denver Post. And the way you used to look for a job was you'd go to the classified ad, primarily on Sunday, and there is an entire employment section, and you would go through 40 pages of jobs, and you'd circle the jobs, and you would send in your resume. And that's pretty much how you used to go look for a job they've cut all of that and you know they can blame craigslist of course they can blame job boards and so forth and so on but i still i'm i'm, I'm just amazed the reach and the influence that newspapers have still are in the, uh, you know and that they gave that up i mean it's the fact that they gave it up helped my business actually thrive a lot more that's really interesting. As an aside, I love that your organization gives back in the form of large job seminars, job fairs, and through those events, you've actually raised more than $150,000 for local charities, such as yeah. the Red Cross and the Denver Zoo. And I also understand your wife is a CEO of the Denver Foundation. So why is giving back to the community in Colorado so important to both of you? Well, I've been involved in nonprofits throughout my career. I've served on a variety of boards from the Volunteers of America to the Rocky Mountain PBS to um, I'm right now I'm on the board of Colorado Outward Bound and just a variety of different boards. And, um, you know, it was really ingrained early in my career, the, the importance of nonprofits and the importance of giving back. Um, when I was the uh, vice president, president of marketing and advertising at Frontier Airlines, we also had a very thriving community relations program there where we gave out about 3,000 airline tickets every year to nonprofits so they, they could use those for uh, auctions, they could use those to, for travel for their staff and so forth. And it's, um, uh, you know, it's just, it's just an important part of who I am and, and who my, my wife is as well. That's just amazing. That really resonates with me and I'm sure all the other fraternity and sorority members on the call, which I know there are many um, in terms of giving back and the importance of that. And hopefully that is going to be also the legacy, not only of you and your wife, but also of fraternity and sorority members there at Colorado Boulder at your alma mater, but really all over the country. I think that's the goal. And I think that is our obligation uh, as human beings is to give back in that way. Um, well, and I'll tell you this also, the, the, the fact is, is that we have about 17,000 registered nonprofits in the state of Colorado, and they're going to be hurting 
They're, they're hurting right now, but they're going to be hurting as they try to recover with the rest of us. And quite frankly, I mean, everyone uh, who's involved in these, I mean, you know, there's, there's big nonprofits, there's small nonprofits, but they, they are the safety net. You know, they provide so much of the resources and uh, provide so much for communities that are struggling. Um, and it's going to be really uh, important for us to really double down and, and support these nonprofits even more so now. You're so right. I'm glad that you brought that up because I'm also involved with a bunch of nonprofits that are hurting right now. And we really have to take a look at that and figure out how we can better support these local organizations. Um, let's get to jobs because I know that's yep. what everybody is really focusing on. COVID-19 sure. is certainly affecting jobs all across America right now. 26 million Americans filed for unemployment benefits over the last five weeks. And about one in six American workers have lost their jobs since mid-March due to COVID-19. So what are the types of companies who are hiring right now? If you want to use specifics, by all means, but who is hiring? Yeah, so there are companies still hiring, believe it or not. I know that, you know, certainly, you know, I've seen job postings go down, but there are still companies. There's Healthcare companies, I mean, the typical kind of companies you'd expect, you know, grocery stores, uh, you know, uh, uh, gig economy type jobs, delivery services, things like that. But there are also professional companies that are hiring. They're hiring accountants, they're hiring HR people, they're hiring PR marketing, um, uh, graphic designers, IT uh, folks. So, you know, the typical lifespan of a job posting is about eight weeks. So right, I've, and I've seen this really start to ramp up a lot more over the past couple of weeks where companies are posting jobs with the anticipation that they're going to be hiring within six to eight weeks as the economy starts to come back on, uh, come, come back online. And so this is a really, really good opportunity for professionals who want to start looking and considering their next step in the chapter of their career. So I'm getting a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, connections with job seekers right now, helping rewrite resumes, helping them think through what it is that they want to do next. Some of it is people who have been furloughed or they're just working from home and they're finding that they have some time available to themselves. And they're th saying to themselves, you know, look, I have this time available. It's, I've never had this kind of time in a, in a very long time. And they're doing some self introspection they're doing strength finders. They're doing all kinds of different things to uh, really start to, to question, you know, what's their next chapter in, in their career? And it, I, I, I find it great. And this is not just the unemployed folks. These are folks that are still employed, but they're using this as an opportunity to do so. Yeah, I agree. I started uh, thinking about and started writing a book, which is something that I've wanted to do my entire career, but I just haven't had this kind of free time to do it, even though I'm still fully employed. So, um, so yeah, so it's just new opportunities pop up and, and now I've been able to start that process as a result. I have a feeling a lot of new books are going to be coming out within the next six to nine months. <laughs> well, an interesting fact is that William Shakespeare wrote King Lear while he was in quarantine from the bubonic plague. That's yeah. a true story. So, That's you know, awesome. I mean, you know, in, in the meantime, my daughter has taught me all about TikTok. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's fantastic. So we are all dealing with the coronavirus pandemic and jobs, as you know, are so hard to come by, even on your own site. Some of the postings have gone down in terms of quantity. Um, and this is especially true, I think, for college students. Many of them are on our call here with us today and recent graduates, people who are graduating here in May. So what things should applicants be putting into their application or their cover letter to boost their chances of getting hired right now? Okay, well, let me, let me take this in a couple of ways, because the, um, the, the young professional who is just starting out, they're just graduating from college, or even they're maybe they're a couple years away. Um, when I was 21 years old, and I graduated from college, I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do. I had an English degree. My father says, are you going to open up an English store? <laughs> you know, the, the university uh, president at the time was a guy named Gordon Gee, a famous university president. I saw him at my graduation and I said, what's the best advice you could give me? And he said, don't ever forget to pay your alumni dues. So, you know, I, I was getting uh, advice from a smart aleck and from a university president who thought, 
he was being cute as well. So I was out there on my own. I was 21 years old, not a clue what I wanted to do. I knew I had skills. I knew I had a background. I knew I had a strong work ethic, but I had no idea whether any of that stuff was valuable to folks in, uh, in, in the professional life. Two years later, when I was 23, I was named the press secretary of a United States Senator. And I had no idea how within that two years, be, from, a, from a struggling recent grad to becoming press secretary to the United States Senator. And I, when I think back about it, you know, a lot of stuff happened within that two years time. Number one is I really did a skills assessment. And the skills assessment was saying, what are the things that I have personally, the things that I've experienced in my young life that are important and valuable in the working world. I had a strong work ethic. I had creativity. I could think on my feet. There was all of these things that came, that I started to understand were important and valuable. And it's important for anybody, and this is not just for recent grads, for anybody to constantly do those skills assessments. Sometimes we forget what it is that is uh, valuable in terms of what we have to do or what, what we have available to, uh, um, to companies and to nonprofits that we want to apply for. By the age of 27, I was the press secretary to the mayor of Denver. I then became a vice president of a major airline for marketing and communications. And, and all of this stuff along the way, um, you know, I completely was reassessing the entire time. What did I learn from my last job? What were the accomplishments? What are the successes? What are the things that I learned? And what are the things that I can um, uh, uh, use to, as, as I progress my career? There's another piece of advice that I'm going to give that's going to sound very odd. And I think this is a very, uh, this is a very uniquely American thing. Humi humility is a four letter word. There's no reason to be humble, particularly when you are looking for a job. This job seeking is a full contact sport. And, you know, I, I look at it, there's really this spectrum. And on one side of the spectrum is desperation, where you come off as begging, so desperate to find a job. The other edge of that spectrum, the other side of that spectrum, is this, this sense of arrogance and egotism. But the red hot center, the red hot center is confidence. Confidence in what it is that you bring to the table, the values that you do, and, and the stories you have that really demonstrate what it is that you've accomplished in your life and the successes that you have. So many people try to give away their credit. They try to give away the things that they have accomplished to, oh, you know, it was the team or, oh, ah, shucks, or all of that. No, don't, do not ever, ever give away your accomplishments. Take ownership of them and take credit for them. I remember my son was playing baseball and it was the um, uh, last inning of the game, and he hit a hit that was drove in three runs, and they ended up winning the game. And I we sat there, and he came back up to us afterwards, and I said to him, I said, you know, that hit is what won the game. And my wife was like, oh, no, no, no. It was a team effort. It was, you know. And I looked at her and I said, were we watching the same baseball game? Because I just saw him last inning knock those guys in, and they won the game. There's nothing wrong with taking credit. Humility is good for some things, but when you're out there looking for a job, take ownership of your accomplishments, your skills, your background, the promotions that you've received, um, the trajectory of your career, how you got from point A to point B, why your boss, why your clients, why your colleagues liked you and trusted you to do, to, to do big things. So all of that stuff is going to come together and it's going to focus in on what it is that you want to do. Because when you have all of those skills, many of them are transferable to different industries, transferable to different career sectors. All of that stuff, um, it, it, it comes into play when you're thinking to yourself, okay, what is the job that I want to do? Even before you write your resume, you got to have a focus about what it is you want to do. So I'll, I'll stop there. We can, we, there's, there's more strategy involved that we can talk about as we go on. But that very first element, and, and again, you know, as a young professional, don't worry. Don't worry about the pressure that you're feeling to start your career and get the job that's going to last you 20 years. Most people today, they're staying in jobs two, three years, particularly young people, when 
entry level salaries, quite frankly, they suck. They're at forty to fifty thousand dollars a year. That's about what I was when I graduated from from college. And you're going to learn some skills. You're going to learn some things and become good at them. And then you're going to move on and go to a different job. That's totally fine. It might be two or three jobs before you finally say, oh my gosh, this is what I really like. This is what I was put on this earth to do. This is what I want to do. You know, I was very fortunate. I, I found out early on, you know, with that job uh, I, as an intern with a senator before I became his uh, press secretary, I found out early on I was really good at public relations. And public relations tied into all of the skills and all the things that I had, that is part of my personality, part of the things I've done. I was a cook throughout college and throughout high school at restaurants, all of that stuff, being able to think on my feet. I was a musician, so I knew what it was like to play with, with different uh, musicians in a band and how to make that sound good and make music. I mean, all of those different things were incredibly uh, helpful to me in, in being able to, you know, to discover that all of a sudden public relations came to me and all those skills came into play in that particular job. Man, that answer is incredible. I'm thinking about so many things with that answer. First of all, I love the confidence piece. I think you're so right about that. You shouldn't be afraid to ask for the job in the interview. Literally right. ask for the job. Literally say, I really want this job. Thank you so much for the opportunity, but this is where I want to work. I mean, that could literally put you over the edge with a pool of candidates of 20, 30 people. Um, so I love that confidence message. When you talked about the assessment, I think you are so right on. If you're young right now and you're either a college student or a recent grad, you are social media savvy. And guys yeah. like me and guys like Andrew are looking to hire people that can help us to get our message out on platforms like TikTok, which we have no idea how that operates, right? So don't be afraid to put that as part of your assessment that you are social media savvy and that has value to CEOs like Andrew and I. There's no question about it. And then finally, also I really liked Andrew's point about um, all the great things that you did and all the compliments you received from coworkers and things like that. You should be capturing all of that on LinkedIn and that's a whole different conversation. But you know, make sure you have testimonials on LinkedIn. I have 50 testimonials of people that I've worked with over the years, including a lot of the companies and fraternities and sororities and universities who have hired me. But that stuff, it's important to capture all of that so people have an understanding about what your coworkers and your customers have to say about you. Um, so that's all great stuff, man. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'll tell you the, the other thing about looking for a job is that you are now a product in the marketplace of job seekers. You are a product. It sounds odd that you think of yourself that way, but the same principles of marketing, branding, and sales apply. So when you think about your resume, for example, that is a branding document. That resume is going to have a section on there that delivers a brand promise. It's going to give the employer that aha moment about what it is that you can do and what you're all about. And from that aha moment, that's going to drive them to look further into your resume. But they're making a decision because in branding, you know, you're hitting the rational side of the brain and you're hitting the emotional side of the brain. And so when you have a resume that is powerful enough to create that, create that moment where somebody is gonna read through the resume and they're making decisions very quick. So it's about organizing the information, it's about you know, how it's presented, but it's also about that statement at the top of your resume saying, this is who I am. This is what I'm all about. This is the value proposition. And from that branding statement, because the branding statement is really a brand promise, right? So there's a, there is a million, um, there's, a, there's a cemetery of great products that could not live up to the brand promise that they made. People bought it through awareness advertising, but then when they actually bought the product, it was not what they had promised. So the brand promise has to be consistent on all the touch points that are part of the job search. So obviously, one touch point is your resume. The second one is your cover letter. The conversations that you have, the interviews that you are talking about, consistent in terms of being comfortable and confident about who you are and what it is that you are um, uh, about your brand itself. You said in a very important thing, Michael, which was making the ask. People in sales, they know all about making the ask. A conversation is worthless unless you make an ask. 
And the apps could be a lot of things. I mean, because you're going to be having a lot of conversations. You're going to be doing networking. You're going to be having what are called informational interviews. You're going to be having a, a, a full-blown interview for the job, hoping to be the one that gets the job offer. And there's a lot of different asks that you can make. So, for example, if you're meeting with a friend or you're made a cold call and you have an opportunity to sell yourself to somebody, you know, obviously, yeah, do you have a job? I would love, I would love to work for this company. Or can you take, take me down to your HR person and introduce me? Or can you open up your Rolodex? Is there five people in your Rolodex that you can give me their numbers to and then you can refer me to them? There's a lot of different ways. It takes people out of their comfort zone, most people. Even sales and marketing people, you know, they're not exactly the best people to sell themselves. It's a, it's a, very, um, it's a very odd thing. But making the ask is, is incredibly important. And, and one other thing I'll say, people respond well to confidence. It's not bragging. It's not begging. It's putting yourself out there and saying, this is who I am. Let me tell you some stories to demonstrate what what I'm all about. I love it. Perfect answer. Um, let's talk and let's drill down a little bit more on the resume piece because I know we've kind of touched on it a little bit, but specifically what types of things should recent graduates or new professionals be highlighting on their resume right now? Sure. Now we, we could spend three hours talking about resumes, but I'll, I'll give you the, the highlights. Number one, um, there's a myth that a resume has to be one page. Uh, Two-page resumes are completely fine. One-page resumes are okay as well, particularly if you're a new uh, recent grad. Maybe you don't have a ton of experience. That's totally fine as well. Here's the problem with resumes right now. Is, um, and it's not a problem with resumes. It's, it's a problem with how the, the job search goes. There's these things called applicant tracking systems. And applicant tracking systems were created as a result of job boards. Um, I talked earlier about how Monster had become this big monster because, you know, you have one job posting out there and there might be 60, there might be 200 people applying for that one job. Well, companies and recruiters, you know, they, they soon found that it was becoming really, really difficult to be able to read through all these resumes. So they, um, this thing called an applicant tracking system, which is basically it's a computer program that is programmed by the recruiter to search for keywords and for key phrases in a resume. And then a, com a computer actually ranks you. Not a human being, a computer. And they'll spit out the top 20, let's say. And so resumes, um, the format of resumes has to conform to the ATSs in order to get through them and be ranked high. And so, um, one of the sections at the top of the resume is going to literally be a list of keywords and key phrases that are taken directly from the job posting itself. Every resume has to be customized to a degree. It doesn't have to be completely rewritten, but there are sections that you have to, um, you, you have to make sure that it is directly related to the job posting itself. Job postings, I can read through a job posting and I can tell you in about three minutes, you know, what are the key things that are going to get me an interview? You know, the qualifications, what problems are they trying to solve? What are the things that, um, uh, the, the kinds of industries, the kind of connections to my background, all of that stuff. And, you know, but it's, but it's important for the resume to, number one, there's a branding section of it that tells who you are, some of your accomplishments. Then there's a chronological section that um, is just, it's just a list of your background and your experiences that um, they go throughout your career. For older job seekers, it's not particularly wise to keep jobs on there that are more than 15 or 20 years. Now this is a case by case basis because clearly somebody might've been at one company for 15 or 20 years. But the problem is, is that ageism does exist. Ageism exists. It's, I'm not gonna candy coat that companies either flagrantly practice ageism or they, you know, inadvertently do it and they don't even realize that there's this unintentional bias towards older workers. Um, and so there's different tricks and tips for older workers to help them get through this process as well. Now, for younger, for younger workers, uh, for folks that are just, um, folks that are just uh, uh, out of school, you know, you really need to start working on this skills assessment and really start making the case and the argument as to why 
you deserve a shot and why you deserve a, a chance. Now, some of your skills are going to be very, I mean, your internships and the jobs that you've already had and the things like that, it's going to make it very clear that you've already got experience and you've already got the type of things that you need to, to that would make sense for a company. Um, for, for other folks who don't have a lot of experience, you need to start looking at the things that, um, the work that you've done for your fraternity or your sorority, you know, that nonprofit volunteer project that you develop, the kind of leadership positions that you've taken on, whether it's in your fraternity or sorority or another kind of a club at the university, any of that kind of stuff. Even the stuff that you did, you know, like me, I was a cook, you know, I, I cooked. I, but I had to get up, you know, 250 meals a night. And, you know, I, I have absolutely no problem explaining to people, you know, how that, how that skill is valuable in terms of being able to think on my feet and, and deal in urgent situations and crisis situations, things like that. Stuff like that is important. And being able to tell those stories, you might think, oh, gosh, you know what? Starting my own lawn mowing company when I was in high school is really not that important. That is huge. I mean, think about the work ethic that is required for that and the risk. And the financial, um, uh, the, all, all the financial stuff. You know, somebody told me the other day, I thought it was very interesting, that a, somebody who works at McDonald's has a lot more transferable skills than a brain surgeon. You know? I mean, if you think about that, I mean, it's like, you know, they have customer service and how to make change and how, you know, how to handle money and, you know, de dealing with all of the stress of, of that kind of a thing. That, that, those are important skills. You might not think of it that way, but they are. They're very, they're very important skills. I agree completely. That's fantastic for new professionals, recent graduates. I'm happy that you're highlighting fraternity and sorority. That's one of the reasons why I'm such a big advocate for fraternity and sorority, because I really believe it allows college students to run a business while they're still at Colorado Boulder, for example. Yeah. And maybe the treasurer of this student organization is managing a six-figure budget. And that's yeah. incredibly important to know, right? And yeah. not just that he was treasurer, but I want you to tell me specifically, give me the data that shows me how you made a difference. What was your impact as yeah. treasurer? Did you reduce expenses by 30%? If so, that has value to me as a CEO. Yeah. No, and you, and you make a great point. Anything that is quantifiable in your background, put it on there. You know, if you increase sales by 50%, if you cut costs by 25%, if you manage people, I mean, any, any, anything that um, you can put on your resume that is quantifiable and shows results. Because, you know, in, in the stories themselves, you know, I mean, that's, that's an incredibly, um, uh, in, you're going to have to tell stories about yourself and your accomplishments mm -hmm. throughout the entire uh, job seeking process. You know, folks, tell me, they say, I'm so sick and tired of talking about myself. You got to get used to it. It's okay. I'm giving you permission. I mean, it's totally, that's, that's what's required. You know, I kind of look at it in, in terms of politicians, you know, politicians, they're running for office and they hit on about five or six key agenda items that they want people to hear and that they, you know, they're poll tested and all of that stuff. They know people are concerned about at this moment in time, it might be the environment, it might be about taxes, it might be this or it might be that. But you know, they've got their positions all lined out and they've got their stories about what they did relating to that issue and what they're going to do and so forth. It's very similar in terms of a job. You know, it's, it's you taking credit, taking understanding what the problem is for that company and being able to connect what you've done in the past to that as well. And again, it, it goes back to this idea of this connectivity to all the touch points in the job search that um, that you have, and and ultimately, you know, I've I've sat there and watched an interview where, you know, let's say it's a finalist interview. There's three finalists in that interview. Three finalists. They've gone through the process of interviewing probably 20 people already, and it, you know they had second rounds and third rounds, and now it's three finalists. Any one of those finalists could do the job. I mean, that's their finalists. They have proven that their background and everything is right there. But only one person is walking away with a job. Offer. And I've always, I've been fascinated watching. I, I consult with companies from time to time on their interviewing um, processes as well. And I always watch, you know, there's like this panel of folks and they sit there and they're madly taking notes and they ask you a question and then they take more notes and so forth. Typically, the person who ends up getting the job, they have turned the interview into a conversation. Mm -hmm. And that's a very different thing. 
all of a sudden the pencils are dropping and people are shaking their heads and they're and you're creating these you know neurons in the brain that um like I was talking about the rational and the emotional side and everybody is that's clicking and you see these aha moments in their head and when that person leaves it's usually unanimous mm-hmm. and the response from people and this is the responses people want you know they did their research I understood he understood what our problems were did a good job connecting his background to what it is that I'm that we're looking for. And, and then there's the emotional side. I mean, those are the kind of the rational, I, I get, I understand why he'd be good at it. But then there's the emotional side. I got a good feeling from him. And like, he's a good people person. I could see him in front of our clients. You know, that's the emotional side where they, there was a connection there. So there's all this stuff that's going on and all these different touch points at the, uh, for, the job, for the job seeker. Let's talk about that a little bit more because this interview process right now during the coronavirus pandemic, I would say it's complicated because building trust over a video call, which is what we're doing right now, is a very complicated thing to do to build that kind of rapport with somebody online. So how do you build that trust in an online Zoom call with a hiring manager? Well, I think it's very similar. I mean, it, it is a little odd because, you know, you don't have that kind of personal connection that, that you would have. And, you know, you can't see all the body language that's going on and so forth. Mm-hmm. But first off, you know, make sure that you have a background that is neutral enough. It's, it's not, you know, um, outside or it's not cute or anything. It's just a neutral background. And if you, if, you know, watch, watch how some of the TV guys are doing it. You know, it's, it's in an office, it's a professional setting. Second off, just like you're going to an interview, make sure you have your power suit. And what I mean by that, it's like you have something that you are wearing that makes you feel great. It fits well, you know, you're, you feel good in it, you know, it's not too tight. You're not worried about a lot of that stuff. And second, and third, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, you know, I'm just, it's, it's, it's a very common thing. There's a lot of nerves in interviews. You know, you get nervous, right? It's, it's a very common thing. If you, if you ever want to see something really fun, and people deal with this in different ways, but there's a YouTube video. Just type into to YouTube or into Google, and it's called um, uh, uh, the Superwoman Pose. And this this CEO of a Fortune 500 company, I forget her name, but she, you know, every everybody has these insecurities. Everybody has these nerves about you know imposter syndrome or whatever. And but they stand. She, she, her technique is she stands in front of a mirror, and she has a Superwoman pose, and she stands that way and gives herself that confidence. It's, I'm, I'm not doing it justice, but, but it's an amazing thing in terms of, you know, before you go into an interview, you're transforming yourself and reminding yourself about all of the things that, um, that you have available to yourself when you go in for that interview. Um, the other thing is um, you need to be prepared and anticipate the questions that are going to be asked in an interview. I'll tell you the first question 99.99% of the time that you're going to get asked is, very nice to meet you. So can you tell me something about yourself? It's the scariest question to job seekers in the world. No, I mean, every, I've, I've met with thousands of job seekers and they're like, I don't know how to answer that. I don't know. How to, what do I say? What do I say? But it's also the most, it's the best question in the world because it's your opportunity to take control of the interview. It's your opportunity to just an open platform for you to say, well, let me tell you about myself. Here's why my last box really liked me. Here's how my call, here's how come my clients adored me. Here's, you know, I think a great way to, t- to start talking about myself is to share with you this awesome project that I led at my last company. You know, they're not looking for you to say, well, you know, in 1984, I started working at the Dairy Queen and from there, you know, I went to college and then, you know, I worked in the kitchens there and so forth and so on. I mean, that stuff will come up if it's, if it's relevant and it's necessary and, and it helps to explain who you are. But it's, it, the thing is, is so many people go into interviews and they feel like they're powerless. They don't have any control. They're the subject of this interview. Instead of saying, you know, okay, let's, get, let's start this interview out by me sharing with you how I can make your life better how I can bring the value of my skills to your company. And it, it takes some practice. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to lie, you know. A lot of job seeking is writing, you know, writing down in self-introspection, even writing job postings that, that, you know, these fake job postings for yourself, saying, okay, 
if I had the most ideal job, what would it look like? And writing that down. Or writing down answers to questions that you can, you can logically anticipate are going to be asked, are going to be important. And then also finding somebody, you know, your spouse, your partner, a friend or something, and say, look, I have these six questions I want you to ask me, and I'm going to respond, and I'd like to have you coach me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, interviews are great, but, you know, when you, when you see somebody online like we're doing right now, even, even right now, you know, I'm kind of um, aiming for the people that are shaking their head going like that, right. you know, because it's kind of affirming to me. It's like, okay, I'm on the right track. It's the same thing in an interview, you know, look, look for those people that are like shaking their head and, you know, they're, they're giving you some body language that is, that is, they're smiling at you and you don't have to rush. You don't have to rush through these interviews. You know, you can take your time. If you don't understand a question that, you know what, I, could, could you um, rephrase that question? I'm not sure I understand understood it don't ever assume they're looking for an answer because that makes you look desperate if you if you if, if you try to make up a answer and, and assume no one's going to notice you know it's, it's okay not to know the answer to a question mm -hmm. but i'll give you one last piece of advice and i used to do this with the mayor because you know we would go into tough media interviews all the time and um one of the hardest things in terms of like investigative reports or, you know, somebody who's like asking hard hitting questions is you give up power if, if because you get scared or you think, oh my gosh, they're asking a tough question. So now I've got to answer it in a certain way to, to get them back on my side. You're the subject matter expert in most cases, and you have to continue to prove that. There's a whole technique called bridging. And it sounds kind of like political spin, but it's not. And if you, t if you type into Google bridging statements, you'll find all of these different types of statements. But it's, for example, someone asked you a very hard question. You say, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Let me tell you what my experience has taught me about that. And then you can, go, you can bridge to a story that gives you that, that experience. Or you could say something like, you know, I can understand why certain people would believe that, but let me tell you uh, an experience I had that w w is a little different. And it's a gentle way of saying, you know, look, I, I don't agree with you and my experience and my expertise will show why. So there's, there's, there's different techniques that you can use during an interview to, to, to feel powerful all the time. That is great. These techniques that you're discussing is really pro level stuff. And I also completely agree with you that in every interview, they always say, tell me about yourself. Yeah. So that means you need to have a success story ready to go. I go to these networking events and people will say to you, oh, what's new? Somebody that you meet or somebody that is there at the event. And you know, that question is going to come up. So instead of just saying, mm, not much, which is a typical standard response to what's new, have a success story ready to go because you know that question is gonna come up and that yeah. blows people away when they hear that. If I tell you that I was working with another fraternity last week on recruitment and within seven days, they got more potential new members for their fraternity chapter than they can possibly handle this fall. That tells you, wow, I want to hear more about that because I have to hire you to help my organization that's floundering right now in terms of recruiting online, which they don't know how to do. But yeah. I have to have that ready queued, that story ready and queued up, ready to go. There, there's, there's a wonderful book, and I just interviewed this author last week. She's from Denver, but she's written this national bestseller. It's called The Fine Art of Small Talk, and her name is Deborah Fine. It's, a, it's an easy read, you know, it takes about an hour and a half to read, but she was an engineer and she lived in a cubicle for the first quarter of her career. And she was always asked to be at business events and she didn't, she was just totally, completely freaked out about talking to people and time, you know, people would come up and say, you know, what's new or, you know, what, what's going on in your life? And it was like, you know, she's terrified. She's just, and, and so she researched and did a ton of work to understand, you know, how you can use those opportunities, both in the business world, as well as in the job seeking world, um, and, and take advantage of those. So, so that it's, it's seen as an opportunity and also being able to go to people that you don't even, uh, go to people that, you know, like when we're at a business event, we, we, we tend to like try and find the people that we know right away so that we can, go around with our people, as opposed to going up to people and learning about them and asking them questions and being creating a new connection uh, from a new company or for a new job opportunity. 
There's one story. I'll, I'll, I'll just tell this quick story because I think it's so fun. This woman who's a reinvention expert, her name is Linda Sollers. She's a wonderful, wonderful uh, career uh, consultant. And she went through reinvention. She was a vice president of marketing at Quest which was the uh, telecom company here, it's now CenturyLink, and got laid off. You know, she'd done this all her life. She was in her mid forties and she got laid off. And so she did some introspection, started looking at different things, some skills assessment and what she wanted to do. She ended up going back and getting a master's degree in human behavior. I think that was, it might've been uh, organizational management, but it was, she, she, wanted to, she wanted to go into career consulting. And, she got her degree and she was having a really hard time trying to get any traction because she'd never done this work before. She had all this other great experience, but nothing in, in that field. And she really wanted to work for this Jefferson County government. Jefferson County government's the second largest county government in the state and was near her and she wanted to be there. They had a great career um, a workforce center and she wanted to work with them. So she kept sending in resumes, didn't hear back, didn't hear back. Then she got a couple thank you, but no thank you letters and so forth. So she decided to take it into her own hands. And she went and sat in front of a King Supers for two days straight from 11 to one, dressed professionally. She had a little portfolio full of her resumes. People would walk in, she'd say, hey, do you work for Jefferson County government? Or she'd say, do you know somebody that does work for Jefferson County government? And some people gave her the stink eye and like, you know, weirdo, but, she, the way she tells it, she says most people, they would stop and she'd have a little two minute spiel about who she was and what she was trying to do. And the ask was, can you take my resume and drop it off at the HR department or with your friend, spouse or whoever that works in Jefferson County? Yeah, no problem. Did that for two days straight from 11 to 1. First week, she doesn't hear anything. Monday of the second week, phone rings at 8.30 in the morning. Lady, this is the head of HR for Jefferson County government. I don't, I don't know who you are, but I got 43 copies of your resume on my desk. <laughs> got a job that way. Got a job that way. Beautiful. Now, if it, if, if it was just that easy, I'd say everyone just go hang out in front of the 7-Eleven and hang out your, or our King Supers and hand out your resume. But that, but that experience has a lot of different points to it. Number one, some of this stuff is taking us out of our comfort zone. Like I say, this is a full contact sport. This isn't just sitting in front of job boards, sending out resumes all day. That doesn't work. 25% of your time, maybe, is, do, is doing that. And even job boards, I mean, mine included. I mean, I, I run a very successful job board, but I'm telling you, don't spend all day in front of it. It's only good for, and, 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 I, and I call them prospect boards. So, you know, you're looking for jobs that make sense and that meet your criteria, not only in terms of your experience, but where you want to work, what jobs you want to work for. All of those things, but a lot, the, the rest of the time is going to be networking. It's going to be writing your resumes and your cover letters and making sure that they are so they're custom to the job that you're applying for. But this idea of going in front of a King Supers and then being able to go up to a complete stranger and say, Hey, do you work for Jefferson County government? Could you take my resume? I mean, a lot of people that that's like, Oh my gosh, I could never do that. We've got a lot more power than you believe. You just got to tap into it and realize that, you know, take, those risks and having that bravery and that courage to do something a little different can all it takes is one person one person saying hey I understand what this person's about I get her I get him they this is this is this is someone that we need to consider mm -hmm. let's talk about that a little bit more that networking piece I think networking right now is a little bit more complicated because we have this social distancing going on right now with COVID-19 so is there a way to build relationships and connections that will turn into opportunities later when many people are working from home right now well that's a great question and I tell you what um I don't know, the people who keep these statistics say that, you know, 60% of new jobs is, are a result of networking. Um, I don't know if that's completely true, but networking is a critical element of job seeking. There is just absolutely no way around it. I mean, it's, it, it's going to open up new doors, new opportunities, jobs that you didn't know exist. There's a, there's a hidden job market out there that is just available through networking. So here's, here's what I think about networking. You need, again, Taking a piece of paper, there's three tiers that you're really looking at. Your first tier networking um, of, of networking are the people that know you the best. They are your advocates. They're your cheerleaders. They're the ones who have ever said to you, if you're leaving your job here, 
make sure you talk to me first. They're your former clients, former vendors, former bosses, former colleagues. Um, they're people who are going to drop what they're doing and say, hey, you know what? Send me your resume. I need to see it right now. I, I know people. I'm going to make some calls on your behalf. You know, what else can I do? And, and actually, even before we get into that, you know, to get out of your comfort zone, I mean, to, 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 one, one of the things that is hard for people is they, they somehow feel as if you're a burden on somebody by asking for help as, as a job seeker. There is absolutely no shame in looking for a job. Everyone you're going to be asking to help you has done the same thing before. I mean, they, that's how they got to where they're at as well. So, you know, this is, this is just a natural part of, you know, uh, your career management and, and everyone else's as well. So don't be worried about that. Now, saying that, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Not everyone is going to get back to you in ways that you might think they would. But so that first tier, you know, they're the ones you're going to go and sit down and have coffee with, brainstorm. Uh, you know, hopefully they have a job for you. Hopefully they're going to, you know, bring you in and meet with the HR person and so forth. Your second tier is going to be more of your acquaintances. These are people that you know. Maybe you haven't worked with them. Maybe they're part of a industry association. They know who you are. Maybe they're, maybe they're a competitor that you have known, and they know, they know that you're in the industry. There are people that you've met at conferences. It might even be people that, you know, you know from your son's little league team or your church or your synagogue or wherever. And your next door neighbor works for a company that you're interested in, and that's your connection to them. And going to them and saying and, and making that phone call. And then the third tier is going to be the cold calls. You know, these are the folks that, you know, you've read a really interesting article in the newspaper about this company, or you've seen somebody profiled in an industry publication, or you've seen them on LinkedIn, or somehow you know about this company or this person or this department and you want to work for them and just making a phone call or sending a letter or and you know for people that are uh, nervous about that write out a script so that you're not nervous you know so that you have something right there and you can say and, and you know you've got the questions that you want to ask and you know one of the asks for the cold call is in addition to you know are you hiring is is there a chance I could come and spend 15 minutes with you? You know, I want to find out more about you. I want to find out more about how you got to where you're at and what advice you would give somebody in my situation. And that's a very different thing as of, you know, hey, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I really want you to consider me for a job. I mean, you obviously do. And any opportunity you have to talk face to face to somebody is gold. It's just absolute gold. And so, you know, make sure you're prepared, you know, bring the bagels and the cream cheese or whatever, you know, and follow up. Thank you notes, just, you know, being sin sincerely thankful is that's an important part of this whole thing, too. Just your, you know, the basic rules of manner and being polite and stuff like that. That matters. I, I, I can't tell you. I mean, this has happened more than once where people, um, even when I was hiring, you know, people would come in for the interview and they were just rude to the administrative assistant. And the administrative assistant, you know, they know what's going on in the company. I mean, they, and they have the ear of their boss and they would come into me and say, you, you're not going to believe what this, this person did to me or said to me when they were out waiting, you know, and it's, it's, you know, it's just, it's, it's just a reminder, you know, all of that stuff matters. It really does. It really does. And I love that suggestion about the handwritten thank you notes. That is a lost art. For some reason, we've lost that. And it's such a great personal touch to get a handwritten thank you note from somebody because most of the time, let's be honest, in the mail, we get bills. That's what we get. But if I get one nice handwritten thank you note from somebody, I'm going to remember them forever. They may or may not be the right candidate for me, but I'm going to remember them forever. And I'm going to do everything in my power to help them get that job, whether it be at my company or maybe I have a suggestion and I call you up, Andrew, and I say, hey, I got somebody really great. Just take a look at this person. I'm going to help that person along in whatever way that I can. Absolutely. And here's the other thing about handwritten uh, thank you notes. You know, include a sentence that helps jog their memory about something memorable in your conversation. Um, thank you so much for meeting with me. I really enjoyed talking about the industry trends as it relates to my experience and blah, blah, blah. So, because they might be getting many thank you notes or, or whatever, and you want to make sure that, you know, oh, yeah, that person is going, oh, yeah, that's right, that's that person. And, and, and you're right. I mean, you know, I, the other thing is I can't tell you how many times this has happened. Um, you came in second. You didn't get the job. 
and two weeks later, they call you back up and they say, hey, you know, so-and-so dropped out, you know, the person we were looking at, you know, the position's open again, would you like it? Um, and, and so, you know, even after maybe two months or something, sending another note to them and saying, hey, you know what, uh, we met a couple months ago and I just wanted to let you know, I'm still interested and excited about maybe working in your company and just keeping, keeping those connections open. Now, I'll tell you the other thing about networking, don't wait till you're looking for a job to network. <laughs> Networking is like a career management 101 throughout your entire career. You know, if you have a job where you're in a cubicle and you're an introvert and you just love that and all of a sudden, oh, the company's gone out of business, you're being laid off, you know, we have a pandemic or whatever, and you're, you're going, oh my gosh, what do I do? And you're feeling like you don't have a network of people. You know, professional associations are amazing opportunities. If you're in a fraternity or a sorority and you have alumni groups in your city, um, I mean, that, I, I didn't even mention that. I mean, universities and fraternities and sororities, a lot of them have alumni groups that have, that have uh, um, job seeking uh, um, committees. But, you know, I, I've, gotten, I've spoken to alumni groups from universities across the country that have an alumni group in Denver, from Notre Dame to Yale to UCLA, I mean, you know, they, people who live in Denver who went there that are connected to those groups and they're very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. I agree completely. That's fantastic. We have a, a bunch of uh, questions that are starting to build up. There were a couple more that I wanted to uh, discuss. Um, if there is a dream company that one of our listeners wants to work for, what is the best way to get this dream company's attention as a job seeker? Oh, it's, it's a great question. Now, um, I don't necessarily, uh, I, I, I think number one is that when you find a job online, for example, or if you have a company that you are really, really interested in, it's your dream company, deep dive into that company in every way that you can and understand what the company is doing, what is their new products, what is their Everything about them, and, and I mean also getting onto LinkedIn and finding out who are the players, who are the people there. Do you have any second, third degree connections, first degree connections, obviously? Is there any connection that you have into that company whatsoever? Go to their website, read about the executives, read about the, the About Us section, look up and just type their name into Google and see what is going on in terms of mergers and acquisitions or their new products that they're coming out with or have they been in the news um, and do everything you possibly can to make as much connection to the people that work there and and understanding the what is going on there um, it's it's just research and networking the crap out of that company and now i would also say that you know when you find a job even even if it's not a company that you really know a lot about and this is something my, my, um, my wife had a job search about two years ago, and I was just, I was really impressed with how she did this. You know, she went out and she, she networked like crazy and found out that there were three or four jobs in, in terms of executive director jobs that were out there. And she found out there were some of the corporate headhunters, some of them were the private headhunters, some of them were just, they were taking resumes and so forth. But she found out who she knew on the board of directors. She knew who, uh, who worked there that, friends of hers that she knew she did everything she could to make sure that people were there was a buzz about her wanting to work for this company and they made it all the way to the um, uh, the uh, CEO of the organization and all of that stuff came into play so you know um, in short just you know do everything you can to get connected to that company and make sure that you're you're networking the heck out of it Love it. Let's go to some of our listener questions because uh, they are starting to pile up here. Janet from Michigan is asking, uh, what do you see in terms of the future of remote jobs, number one, and number two, specifically her area of expertise is pharmaceuticals and life science positions. So what do you see in, in terms of remote jobs going forward? And what about pharmaceuticals, life science positions? Right. Well, um, a couple things. Number one, uh, I'm incredibly optimistic. I know right now, you know, we've gone from a country that's practically at full employment to about 20% unemployment in less than two months. It, right. It's just the, the words would bankrupt the English language trying to describe what's going on. It's just crazy. Um, 
I started doing my business full time 11 years ago. And I started my company and started doing it. You know, I quit my job and began running Andrew Hudson's job list as a full time company um, a week before the stock market crashed. And we began the Great Recession in 2008. And what I found out is that. Uh, you know, I was very fortunate. I mean, my, my company was kind of recession proof in terms of uh, there was always these, these incredible job seekers that were out there now. And then companies were hiring. Companies continued to hire. And I honestly believe based on the past in my, what I've gone through in the past, that our economic recovery is going to be quicker than people think. Saying that, I think that this two month experiment of working from home is going to be uh, on the, a lot of people's front minds. I mean, I think companies, CEOs, um, researchers are going to be looking at this and saying, okay, you know, we've already seen some of this. I mean, we've seen some of this before where it's becoming more prevalent. But I think that working from home is going to be um, uh, more than a trend anymore. I think a lot of companies are going to be out there saying, you know, this is actually makes sense uh, how we can do this. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I, I, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see how fast that ramps up. But you know, these Zoom calls, and I think, you know, the big fears were the obvious ones. You know, how do we keep track of our employees and make sure they're not out golfing instead of, you know, working? And you know, uh, we're seeing all these different trends that have been evolving over the last couple of years, anyway, like unlimited vacation time, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about trusting employees, and it's about trusting people, and saying, you know, look. You you got to get the work done. If you, if you can't get the work done, then there's a problem. Mm -hmm. And it's so I, I think we're going to see more and more of, of of that kind of trust that uh, is 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 put between the employers and the in the uh, employees on this this area. As it relate as it relates to the healthcare jobs, the pharmaceutical jobs, the uh, life sciences jobs, I think you're in a great great position right now. I mean, I think that most people would agree that we got kind of caught flat-footed with this entire pandemic. Um, you know, you could say people have predicted this would happen eventually for years, and that's probably true, but I think that you're in a really, really good position right now in terms of um, not only, uh, 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 you know, the government turning to companies such as pharmaceutical companies to be on the lookout and understanding, you know, how we can protect ourselves better through vaccine and through cures and things of that sort. Um, but I think it's, it's also, it's like, how do we operate in a pandemic environment when we also have other sick people? <laughs> mm -hmm. So there's, there's so many different issues that could go in so many different directions. I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert on, on uh, all of this. I, some of this is opinions. I mean, I'm, I'm an expert on job seeking. And, you know, I think we're all, there's, there's still a, a large amount of uncertainty, even amongst the experts, about how this is going to turn out. Yeah, that's great. And I, I am optimistic. Yeah, as am I. I agree with your assessment. Um, Nicholas is asking, during an interview, how are you better able to word this question? Why would you not want to hire me? Once the interview asked if we have any questions, Nic Nicholas likes to ask this in a way to find out if he's missing any qualifications or experiences that a competitor for the position might have. But every time he says it, it sounds really rude coming out of his mouth. So how would you better word that question? Well, I don't know if I would ask the question. What I would do is, and this is what I tell folks, when you go into an interview, ask yourself, what are the four to five things that you want to get across? So you want to get across your experience, stories about your experience. You want to get across specific skills that are important. You want to get across your connection to the industry or the connection to the company itself. You want to get across your personality. You want to get across, you know, what, what you're going to, what, what you would be like as a teammate, as a worker, you know, your work ethic. I mean, those are just random things. There might be some very specific things within the job posting that they're looking for that you want to get across. And, I, you know, I even tell people to write those things down and, you know, even have a little cheat sheet right in front of you. So at the end of that interview, you're looking down and they're, they're ultimately, they're going to ask you the question, is there anything else you'd like us to know? Is there anything else you would like to say? And then there's also going to be a time when they say, is there anything you'd like to ask us? I, you know, I, I hadn't heard that question. You know, is there any reason why you wouldn't want to hire me? Um, 
I think it, 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 it kind of puts people on the hot spot, you mm -hmm. know, and um, I think that they're, they're going to demur. They're going to, they're going to say, well, you know, we're going to be looking at other candidates and we're going to be looking at everyone's skills and assessing everyone, you know, what their strengths are and everything like that. I don't, I don't think they're going to give, they're going to be willing to give you an answer off the, off the top of that thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, you know, I, I tell you one great question that I like to, uh, for people to ask is, um, um, now that I just think it, I'm just blanking out. No, it's, um, why do you like working here? Asking that of the employer, you know, and the response can be very telling. Yeah. I mean, if the people that are interviewing you are falling all over themselves, telling you, oh my gosh, you know what? I got my master's degree and the company paid for it, or, you know, their benefits program here is terrific. And. You know, um, you know, when my when my mother was sick, they gave me two weeks off, and, and you know, what, whatever it might be. Um, the, the the folks that are saying, well, you know, what? Why don't we have HR take that? You know, or you know, I mean, it's it's just like you know, you can't think of one thing good to say about you know why you like working here. You know, I mean, that you know, you might you you might be running out of there faster than you think. You know, um, and and, and that's the other part of it. I mean. You know, you, you, you yourself have to have criteria about companies in terms of the kind of companies you want to work for. One of the most interesting questions I ask people is, tell me why your most favorite job was your most favorite job. And people tell me about the ethics of the company, the transparency, about how the boss gave everyone the autonomy to do what they're best at. You know, the idea of creating teams, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, stuff that was just not once has anyone ever said to me, oh, my God, I love that job because they paid me so much damn money, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is, you know, that's important. And that's kind of, you know, in, in between the lines, obviously, if it's a good company, they're going to compensate people for what they're worth. But, you know, the, the things that make the difference in terms of wanting to go to work every day with a sense of excitement and leaving your job every day with a sense of accomplishment is not your paycheck, you know, it's, you're spending more time with your colleagues and your boss than you are your spouse and your dog. And, you know, you're, I mean, you, you want to have, in, in, enjoy your work and enjoy your job and then also feel challenged and feel like the stuff that you've learned in college and the stuff that you're putting into play here is, is, is meaningful. That's really helpful. Uh, Lane is a fraternity brother of mine. He's a uh, Sigma Pi that recently found himself unemployed because of uh, COVID-19. He was actually building some in and out burgers, uh, the restaurants around the country. So he's in construction. Um, and he was wondering, what about the roles that headhunters play in the job search? What interests do headhunters have in terms of placing you, as well as how do they determine who they submit your resume to? Sure. So First off, I, I hope that the project that uh, you got cut from working on were not in Colorado because we're supposed to get our first in and out burger in July in uh, Colorado Springs. And, you know, that's about an hour from us, but we were willing to make that trip. Yeah, they were, they were not. Um, mine were in Texas, but uh, well, I'm, you guys should be looking forward to them in the Colorado market. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're excited. Um, we were in California last year and it became my daughter's favorite place to eat, so. But um, to your question, um, two things. There's corporate recruiters, there's headhunters, there's HR managers, and then there's uh, hiring managers. So hiring managers are the most direct person. It's, it's, it's you're going to be your boss. I mean, that's the, that's the person who is, you know, working with the recruiter within the company to write the requisitions and the job posting and so forth and so on. So j just for, for folks out there, just for definition. Um, corporate recruiters um, are really kind of more the private folks that are hired. They get paid a 30% of your salary to land you. Um, they are out there working on behalf of the company to identify people either locally or around the country. And, you know, anybody who is trying to hire somebody for a position wants to be your advocate. It's in their best interest that they find good people. At the end of the year, when they have those performance reviews, you know, the questions that get asked of them are, did you hire the best people for our company? And so they have an inherent interest in making sure that they hire the best people. Now, corporate recruiters, even more so, because it's their livelihood. You know, if 
you know, if it's a hundred thousand dollar job, the company's going to pay them thirty thousand dollars to find somebody good for them. So there's corporate recruiters are typically fairly niche in the industries that they are looking for. They are specialists in, for example, IT or construction and engineering or advertising and marketing. And they typically are looking at people in the mid to senior, mid to senior level positions. That's the kind of folks that they're looking for. Um, not always, but typically that's kind of what they're looking for. So whenever you have an engagement with a corporate recruiter, you know, you, she, they're going to want you to be on your best behavior, your best performance. They will shine your shoes for you if they're bringing you in for an interview. Um, and that's important to them because they are, they are putting you out there on their behalf and saying, this is some of the best talent we've found out there. So you need to work closely with them and say, what is it that I need to do to be good for you? How can I best represent myself on your behalf? What are the things that this company is looking for? What are the, and, and they will tell you because they want you to get hired because they get paid if, if you do. So, you know, make sure that the corporate recruiters are your friends. Make sure that you are not shy of telling them, say, you know, look, you know, you're putting me up here. I want to get, I want the job. Let's work together so that we can make this happen. Um, now, identifying corporate recruiters, sometimes they're identifying you. So your LinkedIn profile, incredibly important to be updated, to be professional, and also to let them know that when, just by looking at your LinkedIn profile, that you are open to being recruited. So there's a thing, um, a little trick that folks do right next to your name when you type in your name on your LinkedIn profile, that first header, in parentheses, L-I-O-N. That means LinkedIn Open Network. And that means you are open to recruiters, you're open to people that are willing to come chat with you. I know some people, they, they, they don't like that idea. There's privacy issues that they, you know, I'm not just gonna accept open invitations from anybody. But that's a, that's, a, that's a key acronym for recruiters that you are willing to have conversation. The other part is looking at the other websites like Indeed where you can up, upgrade or you can upload your resume. I have a thing on there where you can, uh, up, on my site where you can upload a profile as well. Most people do that. But you know that, that is a very, very common thing these days. It's the reverse job search. You're not, you're not just sending in your resume. They're actually out there looking for you. That's fantastic. Really, really good stuff. Uh, Andrew, so where should our listeners go to learn more about you, your company? Maybe they want to start applying for jobs on your website. Where should they go to learn more about you and your organization? Sure. It's all, it's all at my website, andrewhudsonsjobslist.com. You can also get there at ahjobslist.com. Um, I am going to post this as well as I know you are. Um, I have a YouTube channel. Um, just type into YouTube, Andrew Hudson's jobs list. And I have some other seminars up there that I've been doing as well. One on reinvention, one on working in nonprofits. There's one on looking for a job for people over 50. And I'll be adding more and more of those on as well. So when you, um, uh, when you record this and you send it to me, I'll slap it up there as well. Because I think this has been a really good conversation. I've loved this conversation. Please go and visit Andrew's YouTube channel. Uh, check out all the different resources that he's got there. Um, certainly check out our YouTube channel as well. As well. It's youtube.com slash Greek University INC. There's lots of resources for college students and fraternity and sorority members to improve their organization. So we're just trying to get the information out to the people the best way that we know how. And Andrew, this has been so enlightening for me and for all of our listeners all over the country. You've done a great thing for us and you've done a great thing for all the job searchers that are out there right now trying to find work all across America. And I just want to say thank you on their behalf because uh, you know that commitment that you're showing right now uh, it just speaks volumes about the type of person that you are, um, that you and your wife want to improve your community there in Colorado, and you're going to do whatever it takes to make that happen. And, and we really appreciate that. Well, thank you. And if, if, if I could just say one last thing, and that is that as, as a job seeker, and this, 
rejection is common and, and as, as you're looking around there. It's just common. And don't worry about the rejection. But I've seen people who have gotten into what I call the job seeking quicksand. And it basically goes like this. You wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror and all of these words come to you. Too old, overqualified, underqualified, not enough skills here, not enough skills there. I'm not going to get a job that's this, that's that, that's this, that's that. And all of a sudden you create this person that even you don't recognize. Stay away from that. Wake up in the morning and remember and recognize all of the promotions you've had, the awards you've won, the trajectory you've had, the promotions you've had, all of the skills that are part of your arsenal of value that you have out there. Every, I, I've worked with many job seekers who try to dumb down their resumes because you know, they don't think that this is valuable or they don't think this is valuable. Take credit, take ownership, don't worry. If, if you've been rejected, you, one, of the, one of the really harsh realities is you get ghosted. You put your blood, sweat, and tears into a resume, you send it in, and then nobody, you hear nothing. Or you actually go to an interview, and then they don't call you back one way or another. You, you don't make assumptions that that's about you. Make a, you know, it's, you have no idea what, what happened. They might have killed the position. They might have hired internally, whatever it might have been. All it takes is one. One person that's going to see what you have to offer and you just have to continue to remain confident and re have that courage and don't let the, um, uh, don't let, don't fall into the job seeking quicksand to get to the degree where you don't even recognize yourself. You, all of that stuff on your resume is true. I worked with a, I worked with a salesperson, award winning salesperson, and he came up and I said, okay, what are your challenges? And he says, I'm too old. I'm, my resume stinks. I'm not very good at interviewing. I'm not this, I'm not that. Um, I'm unskilled here. I'm overqualified here. Um, went through about 20 things. And I stopped him and I said, all right, tell me the reason why somebody should hire you. And this is a guy who could sell you the shirt off your back. But when it came to talking about himself, I mean, it was like, well, I'm, I've got a good work ethic. I'm reliable. I'm trustworthy. And I'm like, those are expectations. Those are the things that every employee is going to be required. Tell me specifically, what are the things that you bring to the table? And it's a very different thing. So all of this stuff I'm talking about, it starts with you. And it starts with you being able to have the confidence and the courage to talk about yourself in ways that people are going to start nodding their heads. And that level of confidence that is going to seep into them and creating those aha moments. And they get you and they understand you. Everyone can do it. I've never seen anybody that's not employable. So thanks for having me. Yeah, this has been fantastic. The one ask I have for all the listeners, please share this. There are tons of job seekers out there right now that can really use this information. So the one ask that I have to our audience and everybody that's listening right now, click share and please send this out wide distribution all over the internet, all over the country. Other job seekers could really use this information. And the more that we do our job of sharing that with our network, the more we can get Andrew's voice into homes all across the country. So thank you so much for being here, Andrew. Thank you so thank much you. to our listeners for being here today. And we'll see you on the next episode of Fraternity Foodie. Bye for now.